Hey guys, welcome back to another League of Legends video, and today's gonna be a discussion topic that I think has been on a lot of people's minds. So we're gonna take a quick diversion from my why no one slash why everyone plays videos to talk about this really quick. I feel like this has been a running gag ever since around Season 5 when Riot became increasingly more adventurous with champion design in that they wanted to make every champion feel super unique and interesting to play to encourage players to try it out, right? And the intentions behind that are good. There's nothing wrong with attempting to be innovative or pioneering and all that, but I started noticing much more intricate and wacky champions around late 2014 to early 2015. We had Bard who was the roaming support, Rek'Sai with all of her tunnels, Tom Kench who could swallow people, Alawi had tentacles, Aurelian Soul was a giant space dragon, stuff like that. And ever since, every new champion released would be defined by a playstyle that only they had. It was no longer trying to fit within an archetype or classification of champions, such as an assassin or a mage, it was now just trying to be an individual pitted against 140 other individuals. Which brings me to the topic of this video, the problem with new champions. This isn't a rare opinion over the past couple of years. We've made jokes and memes like no other, such as 200 years, or not knowing what Aphelios does, or Seraphine being a second Sona, and that's all in good fun, but I actually want to address the underlying issue with Riot's champion philosophy that I think needs to be made aware of from a game design perspective and the game's personal brand. So I'm going to break down this video into two parts. First, the game's lore and then the game's mechanics. So for the first half, I'm not going to be talking about how ridiculously overloaded a champion's kit is because I'm discussing specifically how each champion exists within the universe of League of Legends. Then in the second half, I'll talk about champions in terms of how they play in the game. So if you're watching this video and you don't really care about lore or storytelling, you're welcome to skip to the timestamp I have on the video, but I would appreciate it if you watched the whole thing since lore and gameplay are connected in more ways than you might think. I know there are some players who actually straight up don't even know anything about the game's story, but it's important to touch on this because it's what led to the downward spiral of new champions. Having been released in early 2009, the League of Legends world, or more specifically Runeterra, it was just your standard Tolkien-esque magic and monstrous fantasy world. We had some mages, warriors, archers, some monsters, knights, undead, demons, even demigods all mixed together into one package. And so most people knew what to expect when realizing further champions, and they've been relatively consistent with maintaining the character's lore relative to the nation that they came from. Each champion added to the game made sense within their regional sphere of background and influence, and in my eyes, I believe Riot was focused primarily on establishing them with a specific category, then tailoring their kit to match a class within that category. Demacia's traditional medieval standards mean that their champions would often be much more upfront about things. Aside from perhaps Vayne, these champions rely on mano y mano, nothing too fancy or skeptical about them. No tricks up their sleeve. Demacia's principles are very honest, and that's why so many of them are straightforward. Garen, Jarvan IV, Fiora, Shinzao, Lucian, Quinn, Silas. They're all about being right in your face and taking you head on. Because of how much they cared about justice, duty, and honor, many of their champions came with a defensive ability to reflect their desire to protect and uphold their values and traditions. Just by looking at this list, almost all of these champions have some self-peel or form of protection. Similarly, but not quite, Noxus is all about power, cunning, ends justify the means. It's a very Machiavellian kind of outlook on things. They would have champions very focused on offense, aggression, destabilization, espionage, even assassination. Noxus had a similar brute strength in the form of Mordekaiser, Draven, Darius, and Sion, but because of their acceptance of more dark and sinister tactics, we would find a lot of champions who focus on either quick attacks, deceit, or psychological warfare like Talon, Swain, LeBlanc, and such. Very few of these champions come with protection or defense, a lot of them are almost purely offense and snowball-heavy champions. Ionia is a place of spirituality. Many people here place heavy emphasis on enlightenment, naturality, balance, self-realization. This allowed for champions to be very artistic and graceful in their ways. It's a land rich with magic and enchantment. So we would also see a lot of half-human, half-animals such as the Vestayans, Wukong, Zaya, Rakan. Maybe some ninjas and samurai like Shen, Akali, Yasuo, Yone. Perhaps a slew of mages like Ari, Sindra, and Karma. Or even those who studied our particular martial art like Lee Sin, Master Yi, and Irelia. Since Ionia was about the inner self, the champions that hailed from there were maybe the most unique from one to another, but you could still understand a hint of spirituality within each champion that was derived from that culture. Aside from, you know, some of the super crazy people like Jin. But one more example, because I don't want to waste that much time talking about every single nation, Zaun. Zaun is a ghetto, kind of dark crime city with a black market, a lot of illegal crap, as well as reckless industry, sewage, pollution, garbage, not really the best place to be but it gives birth to some very interesting and colorful champions, stuff that we would expect from a lawless land with no rules. Dr. Mundo singed Victor with minds as crazy as their inventions. 
And then we have Jinx and Echo, rebellious delinquents but still very resourceful because they need to be in order to survive down there. And then we would have some really freakish monsters because lord knows what kind of toxic radiation is down there, like Twitch, Warwick, and Zack, all abominations you would only see in a place like Zaun. My point is that champions made sense in where they came from. Their gameplay was less about individuality and more about conformance. You would think less of that champion's own identity and more about what faction they were affiliated with. And that to me was the driving inspiration behind a lot of champions. They were created from the land. They were designed from their nation. They were made to represent their place of dwelling. And this leads me to arguably the biggest issue about new champions. Riot took that design philosophy and kind of flipped it backwards. Instead of designing a champion that belongs to a region, they designed a region to belong to a champion. Let me make an analogy. Everyone knows that the hallmark of a good cake is not the frosting, it's not the filling, not the decorations. It's the batter, right? The batter of a cake is the foundation. If you do that poorly, it doesn't matter how pretty the cake looks, it's gonna taste terrible. Many of the new champions these days feel like Riot was trying to build a cake around the decorations and not the base when it's supposed to be the other way around. When you create a new character, a new system, new content, new anything, you have to first ask yourself as the designer three questions. Why do I want to make this? Does it make sense to add this to the game? And finally, how does it fit within the constraints and confines of the gameplay and or narrative? The first one may seem sort of a no-brainer, but it's a question many forget about. Why do I want to add a giant blacksmith fire god to the game? Why do I want to add a walking tree whose favorite color is spring to the game? Why do I want to add an edgy teenager with a living scythe to the game? Why do I want to add a bubbly child that throws stars around to the game? Why do I want to add a pop star idol that looks like she's from Sailor Moon to the game? When you physically ask these questions to yourself, you then have to find a reason to put them into that game. I'm not saying you cannot add new things on a whim, but you have to understand why. Because if you can't answer that question, there is no way you'll be able to answer the other two. Take Sana for example, she's one of the more well-designed modern champions in my opinion from a gameplay and thematic perspective. Why do we want to add Senna to the game? Well for one, we knew her long ago when she and Lucian were fighting Thresh, and Thresh trapped her soul. Maybe a lot of players, myself included, wanted to know what happened in that story. And seeing Lucian rescue her from Thresh's Lantern felt like a proper closure to that. The second question, does it make sense to add Senna to the game? Absolutely, she was part of Lucian's lore, she had interactions with the Shadow Isles being ghost hunters with her husband, she's a prisoner of Thresh. She has every right to have a place in the game because she was here long before her conception as an actual champion. Now the third question, how does it fit within the constraints and confines of the gameplay and or narrative? Having been trapped within Thresh's Lantern for however many years, she's assimilated the powers of the Shadow Isles, which is why her passive, her W, and her E have dark, ghoulish properties. She has the same soul-stealing function as Thresh. She can create Black Mist, which we know from another Shadow Isle champion like York. And her abilities have the same dark, gloomy appearance and ambiance of green, gray, and black, similar to those champions. However, her past life is still present in her kit in the form of piercing darkness and dawning shadow. She still is a light user like her husband, only her abilities have morphed into a mixture and corruption of light and dark. From a design standpoint, if we ignore her numbers for a bit, her gameplay is amazing, everything makes sense. Those three questions are pivotal for adding any champion to League of Legends. Why do we want to add Silas to the game? Because Demacia is all anti-magic and we know the country hates mages, so it would be cool to see some representation of the oppressed minority. Does it make sense to add Silas to the game? Of course! Demacia is touted as the paragon of morality, they can't obviously harboring any dark secrets, oh wait they do. And Silas is trying to expose the nation for their abuse of mages. How does his gameplay fit the narrative? Well he's still from Demacia, so he reflects the kingdom's culture. His passive, Q, W, and E are all quite upfront and very straightforward, physical in nature, not in terms of damage, I'm just talking about the way he attacks. But his ultimate, let's be real, he basically has the shotting gun, uses his innate powers to copy the skill signature of any champion's ultimate. That rounds out his kid to be a mage who was forced into submission by Demacia, trying to break out and undermine the current authority, using the very chains they used to bound him against his oppressors. He may be a mage, but he's also a Demacian. It makes sense for his kit to be a mixture of both. That sort of design philosophy to me has been lost by a lot of new champions. Not saying that every new champion has this issue, I just gave two examples of modern champs that still work within the grand scheme of things. But then we also have a lot of really strange ones that don't seem to really fit in the game's universe. Kai'Sa, Zoe, Yumi, Samira, Set, Nico, and the most egregiously one Seraphine. Each of these champions seem like they were created first to be game characters before they were created to be part of the game's lore. Ordinarily, that wouldn't be too much of an issue if we were talking about a game like, say, maybe Call of Duty, because that game doesn't care about storytelling. At least to my knowledge, I don't play COD, I wouldn't know. 
but League is a very lore intensive game, so it needs to get through that phase first. The Void is home to freaks, usually all monsters or beings of some form of cataclysmic non-existence. Cho'Gath, Kog'Ma, Rek'Sai, Fel'Koth, all really primal and abhorrent creatures. They seem to live by their nature, not really their nurture. And then there's Kai'Sa. Yes, I know she's Cassidy's daughter, but if you look at her, you wouldn't think she's really someone from the Void because literally everyone else in the Void is either some monster or a human that turned into one like Cassidy and Malzahar. Kai'Sa may have the same color scheme and perhaps clothing and whatnot from the Void, but her attitude, her speech, personality, her directive, none of them match what you would think from the Void. Samira is also sort of the same issue. She's basically Dante from Devil May Cry, but essentially she's the bounty hunter mercenary who goes around starting fights because she can. And she just happens to be a Noxus, but when you look at her, she could also easily be a part of Bilgewater or Piltover. Her motif is all about badassery. She has this disrespectful YOLO type of personality, right? Sure, you could argue that she has similar tendencies to Draven, but she has a gun. There are no other gun champions in Noxus, literally not one. You know what nations are very gun heavy? Bilgewater and Piltover. Now some of you may go, some people start off in one place and move to another. I agree. Kane was originally from Noxus, but he's classified as an Ionian champion. Samira could have gone to Bilgewater, got herself a gun, and moved back, but I still think my point stands in that there's almost nothing about Noxus within her. Aside from her arrogant sense of showmanship that she shares with Draven, you can't really associate her with Noxus's penchant for militaristic expansionism, deceitful trickery, or shadowy espionage. Last, and most certainly least, Seraphine. Now look, I know there are a lot of Seraphine haters out there who are saying, frankly, a lot of extremely unnecessarily toxic stuff about the champion. But I also harbor my own grievances of the champion in that I feel like the champion just does not belong in the game in any way. There have been tons of videos criticizing her design and release, and I suggest you watch those instead because this video isn't about targeting a specific champion, but one look at Seraphine and you don't think of innovation. You don't think of engineering, progress, craftsmanship. When you think of Piltover, you think of machinery like Heimerdinger's turrets, or Orianna, tools like Ezreal's gauntlet or Vi's giant knuckles, enhanced battleware like Jace, Camille. Everything from Piltover has this sort of steampunk or almost like a gritty and mechanical kind of look to it, where Seraphine looks like she was from Cardcaptor Sakura and her hoverboard looks like a DDR machine. It just does not make sense. Before you assume that I think there shouldn't be exceptions to the rule, Silas is part of Demacia, but he's an exception to Demacia's strict and stringent values in every way, while still having an appearance and theme that is Demacian. Jin is from Ionia, and while he may have a very divergent style and conduct, he still possesses the same sense of spirituality, actualization of the self, and a taste for art and beauty that Ionia is known for, just in a really twisted way, with an obsession for the number 4. What I'm trying to say is that it's important to make sure the content belongs in the game's universe. It wouldn't make much sense to add a paintball gun or an ice cream truck to, I don't know, a game about bugs, right? No matter how good your idea is, it needs to fit within the established universe, and Riot seems to be forgetting the very rules that they set for themselves. Now onto the part probably many of you care about more than the lore, the champion's actual gameplay. This is where the 200 years or what does Aphelios do memes become popular. Prevailing Wisdom knows of power creep, the sense that new content is added to the game that partially or completely overshadows old content to the point of rendering the latter obsolete, while also overinflating metrics of a game to astronomically ridiculous numbers, like going from 1000 damage, 2000 damage to 100 billion damage or something like that. But there's another pitfall in game design that is less known, however it can be even more insidious and inevitable, feature creep. Despite both facets sounding similar, feature creep is a bit different. In layman's terms, it's when you focus too much on quantity and less on quality, trying to stuff as many things into a game that may or may not improve or enhance the essential experience of that content. Feature creep is basically the game design version of less is more. We're way past the very primitive and bare bones era of League of Legends when kids used to be one sentence or one line, like move faster when attacking, attack faster when attacking, every fourth ability stuns, every fourth ability strikes twice, passive lifesteal or health regeneration, so on and so forth. And then the abilities were usually designed in that Q did damage, E was some sort of escape or peel tool, and W might have been a buff. Even your ultimate was really simple too. Ezreal shot a giant projectile. Dr. Mundo gained massive health regeneration. Garen had an execute. Renekton and Nasus went super sane, and stuff like that. They were simple to understand, had simple strengths and simple weaknesses. Now champions are being released that have passives with more text than some champions' entire kits and it doesn't always translate to more intricate and complex gameplay. In fact, oftentimes, it can do the exact opposite and make champions feel very constrained. Some of the most popular champions to this day have very simple abilities. Ezreal, Lee Sin, Darius, Lucian, Ari. 
These champions have somewhat rudimentary kits, but they're all fun to play because of the way each ability intertwines with one another. When it comes to detail, there's very important balance you need to keep in mind because if you overcomplicate things or inundate players with too much information, it actively leads to player disengagement. Why do you think games like Minecraft, Mario, Pokemon, and such are so popular? Because they're simple to understand. Yet in spite of their very elementary premise, they have some of the most depth to them because players can spend more time focusing on learning, exploring, advancing the game, and less time dealing with things that just aren't fun to deal with. Think about it this way, you could do way more with addition and subtraction than you can do with calculus and differential equations, despite the latter two being way more complex and advanced in nature. They actually are useful for many less situations than the former two because they're too specific. The same holds true for champion abilities. I understand Riot's desire to make their champions dynamic and sinuous, and I will agree that these champions can be very explosive and cool, like Silas, Pike, Kane, Rakan, Samira, and Yone, but they can be very difficult to manage. There's a reason why so many new champions are such balanced nightmares, because there's just too many factors and aspects to their playstyle that need to be looked at before any change can be made safely. You can look at someone like Jax and go, okay, he's really strong now, let's see what we can do. Is he attacking too fast too easily? Okay, let's lower the attack speed buff on his passive. Are his defensive tools too generous? Okay, maybe increase the cooldown on his E or lower the resistance bonus on his ultimate. Because Jax is a simple kit, he's simple to balance. Probably the most notorious example is Ophelios. He straight up had to get nerfed like 8 times before he stopped being broken. His kit was just so overloaded that Riot could not figure out how to lessen his power without absolutely crippling him, and then they crippled him anyway. Likewise, these champions can also spiral out of control with even tiny buffs, just like what happened to Kaisa when she got released. Somewhat underwhelming and a little weak at first, but then they gave her numbers just a tiny bit more oomph across the board, and all of a sudden she became instant picker ban and had to get nerfed several times over. Reworks are also an issue to some extent. In my opinion, Riot has done a much better job with reworks by turning really messed up champions into successful ones with their own identity in a much healthier kit, like Pantheon, Scion, Fiddlesticks, Nunu, and Warwick. And even since, I think Warwick has probably received the best rework in the history of the game. But they also had some reworks go way too poorly, like Aatrox, Irelia, Akali, and LeBlanc, with LeBlanc being such a problem that they reverted her back to her old state. Before, each of these champions were simple, and yes, they were somewhat outdated and could use a bit of touch-up, but their reworks have sparked more controversy than even some new releases because they went from straightforward champions with straightforward strengths and weaknesses to no counterplay 1v9 machines like Aatrox and Irelia, or champions with just a really oppressive or annoying gimmick like Akali and LeBlanc that was just so hard to play against. The more complicated you make a champion, the more complicated their problems will be. Players are growing increasingly frustrated with how many more things they have to micromanage when not only playing as that champion or with that champion, but against it. As champions are released with more overloaded and more complex kits like Aphelios, Camille, Kai'Sa, and Samira, players will have to spend more time and mental energy trying to figure out who they're up against and less on themselves, which in turn will make it more difficult to improve at the game since you're facing an increasingly convoluted battlefield. One might argue that Riot has no choice but to make champions like this, because with over 140 champions it would be pretty difficult to stand out, and to some extent you are not wrong. Each champion has one passive, three basic abilities, and one ultimate. There's only so much you can do with that constraint in place before there's some overlap. Let's take Super Smash Bros Ultimate for example. Because each character has a fixed moveset, a lot of them may have very similar attacks. Almost every sword character has a wide arcing slash for an up air, or a lot of characters have a sex kick for an air, or a counter for a down beat. So naturally you have to find ways to spice things up or encourage players to try new characters, otherwise they would have no reason to step away from their current comforts to try new things. But you cannot abandon restraint and just stuff as many things into something as you can because that can have the exact opposite effect. A lot of players are averse to playing newer champions because they're too complicated. Let's say you were a Tristana main your whole life, and then in comes Samira, Callista, Zaya, and Ophelios. Champions with a way higher skill floor and skill ceiling. You spend so much time working on improving your fundamentals to complement Tristana's strong but plain kit that it feels like too much effort to try out these new 80 carries with 20 different things that you have to worry about. Now there are players, the hardcore ones, who find joy and gratification out of overcoming those difficulties and challenges, but that makes up not even 10% of the entire gaming industry. 90% of all players are casual. If you watched my Why Everyone Plays Ezreal video, that was one of the reasons why he was so popular. The amount of mental energy it takes just to play these new champions to a competent level is not worth it no matter how much better they can be once mastered. Going back to the cake analogy, if you add in too little decoration and toppings, the cake is boring, uninteresting, bland, predictable. 
Add in too many decorations and toppings and it begs the question, are you even eating cake at that point or is it just a bunch of fruit and chocolate? To sum it up, I feel like Riot is beginning to neglect and disrespect the design philosophies that made League of Legends such an awesome game in the first place. Whether it's because they're too concerned with profit over a product or if it's because they've just gotten a little too adventurous, they need to take a step back. I love League of Legends as a game and I love the characters and the lore, but recently the new champions and some reworks have diminished the quality of a game rather than improved it. There's probably a 0% chance anyone from Riot will ever watch this video, but if someone does, I just want to express that I don't have any ill will towards the company or the game. League of Legends has a lot of problems, but so does every game. As a game designer myself, I simply made this video just to voice my thoughts and criticisms on the growing absence of care and calculation when it comes to designing new champions, and I hope this video was helpful to those who needed it and entertaining to those who wanted it. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below if you think it was a good watch or if you disagree with my opinions. I'd love to hear what you have to say about this, but guys, if you'd like to support the channel, best way you can do so is leave a like on this video. Don't forget to comment down below, subscribe for future content, and check out my older videos if you haven't already. Also, if you do feel generous, please consider donating to my channel either through PayPal or Patreon. It would help a bunch. Links are down below. But for now, that's going to be it for today. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon for the next video. Take care.